Hello, welcome everybody to High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing, our first lecture, which is really lecture zero, if you want, about a prologue. So this lecture cover, covers essentially a lot of details about the modus operandi of the course. So what are the assignments? What are the exams? What are the quizzes? What are the content? So lots of questions you probably have about the course. So this is rather, let's say, a warm introduction to the course materials. And we basically start with this by having a lot of these logos and these logos that you see there. Um, basically reflect a lot of my funding as a university professor doing a lot of research. So definitely research is a very important component of a professor. So teaching is a little bit less maybe, but still I try to convene here a very good course for you. And uh, this course is offered as part of the Icelandic HPC National Competence Center for HPC in Iceland. Here that you see that is funded under the umbrella of the EuroHCC project. And I will talk about this much more uh, in one of the slides during out this prologue lecture. If you want to contact me or want to have more material, much more material, also connecting to the HPC community, um, our social media activities are quite um, much more advanced today. So if you go to Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram or Twitter, or basically just explore the YouTube channel, you would see that HPC is a lively community. There's lots of international, let's say, colleagues that work together with me and others to really bring HPC on the forefront of science, of engineering, to support basically new breakthroughs in science and engineering. Also under the new funded umbrella of the Euro HPC joint undertaking. Also there, I will talk a bit more in this lecture. So, <clears throat> The whole course is organized based on lessons learned from a long time. So we basically started with this uh, around eight or seven years ago with having HPC courses. We took into account the, let's say, firstly, the timeline of assignments and exams and all of that. But also, secondly, of course, mostly your feedback as students, what is good, what is bad, um, how early you give out the assignments and so forth. So you will see a kind of, um, let's say, uh, outline of this course, which in the first place seemed to be, let's say, quite a lot of lectures, but they are very much, let's say, motivated around our assignments. You see here a lot of green material, which is much more practical topics. Instead of using, let's say, lots of theory that we've done in earlier courses, maybe in 2013, 14, we now switch to models where, let's say, lots of practicalities will be coming very early for your first assignment so that you can start your assignment one very soon. And then we have some conceptual topics about parallelization fundamentals, advanced MPI technologies and techniques here. It's a message passing interface, a very much known parallel programming paradigm these days. And by doing so, you would have basically lots of background already to be, you know, in the HPC community, someone who understands MPI codes, parallel computing, massively parallel programming, and so forth. But then we carry on with much more advanced topics. So we think about more about parallel algorithms um, and always data and big data goes along it. So we will talk about data structures as well. And then when we have this kind of distributed memory, which this is all about in the beginning, we also look a little bit, what is the idea with, you know, doing shared memory programming with the so-called language code OpenMP, which is a de facto standard for basically shared memory programming today. And then of course you can combine these things doing hybrid programming. You can identify patterns, which are very common to many of the scientific engineering applications we will face in the course. Then, um, of course, there's a small, let's say, lecture that goes into a very large region, really, which is about debugging, profiling, performance analysis of parallel codes, because you can imagine the complexity of programming parallel is much more different than doing serial codes with a couple of threads or so. So here, we talk about scaling up to very different CPUs, like thousands of CPUs. We're talking about 
maybe using much more than one GPU under your workstation somewhere in the desk. So here we're talking about using lots of different GPUs maybe, which is also the context of lecture nine. So where we then look into the new idea of using accelerators, um, graphical processing units, the so-called GPUs, which initially was very much driven in the last couple of years by NVIDIA, but now we see AMD and others actually also coming along and we will talk about this as part of lecture nine. Then for what you will use these accelerators in HPC on cutting edge HPC machines, this is by far um, outnumbered today by many scientific libraries, but also one scientific domain called parallel and scalable machine learning and deep learning. These are really techniques in the area of artificial intelligence that really make use of GPUs and accelerators by orders of magnitudes, and we'll talk about this. And it also shows a little bit the shift of the course. So when we have the first part on the left-hand side here, which is really about methods, about techniques, general paradigms in HPC, we will move in the second part of the lecture. Really, you see in lecture 10, 11, and up subsequent lectures, really going into scientific domain. So we will learn not only about artificial intelligence, but also about neurosciences, health, medicine, how you use HPC in those particular uh, domain specific fields really. And there's another big region of computing, which is called computational fluid dynamics that you maybe know from crash tests of cars. So when you have, let's say a car crash and you want to analysis the materials, you want to have the analysis of the design, you would do that all in the computer. You burn a train many times in the computer and you will understand smoke, you will understand the, let's say, um, the flames of different materials all in the computer before you really manufacture anything out in the field. So basically, you basically use computing a lot with finite elements, with computational CFD codes, as it is called, to do this. But also, of course, you can imagine that also weather and uh, many other aspects are really, you know, like flow of um, any which, you know, fly fluid, water. This is all about computation fluid dynamics and we will talk about it. So then there are other interesting topics around biology, bioinformatics, which takes HPC really very much for doing lots of different uh, ideas of tackling scientific problems. One of it is of course the human brain, understanding that much more that we had in the neurosciences, but in systems biology, we kind of going a little bit more personalized. We want to try to analyze what about genes and want to understand what essentially is the idea of so-called proteins, which do a very interesting job in the human body. And we will talk about this and how Monte Carlo methods and so on can help solving those problems. And with this, I would like to convey also the second message of the second part of this course. So we here pick different emphasis on all these domains Obviously, I cannot tackle all the different domains which are apparent in HPC. It's almost unlimited today. HPC has been coming up in all the different domains these days. Everybody needs high performance computing. But here we pick different pieces in order to make significant points. And one of it is perhaps in the neurosciences, really the different orders of scales. In the finite elements, computational fluid dynamics, we talk about something called uh, adaptive mesh refinements when your mesh in HPC is not any more static. In systems biology, we deal with the lots of uncertainty, so we have to use Monte Carlo methods. In molecular systems, material sciences, we go on uh, understanding the use of libraries much more and the really small world, so to speak, in HPC that's apparent. And then in terrestrial systems and climate, we really learn how to couple different codes with a coupler from Oasis to really understand how the water modeling would be across different spheres. So if you think about that water comes in the atmosphere, it also is underground water modeling. It's, you know, surface and underwater. So there are different areas where exactly this could make the change. Then the epilogue is much more a lecture where we talk about your jobs in the future where we talk how we can map the content of the course to job requirements, to job, you know, basically uh, job descriptions so that you can see 
that with this material within the course, you have a very good chance to really apply successfully some for some of the jobs which are in the domain of power computing, scientific computing, as it's also called many times. Throughout these kind of rough outline here, um, which is really more or less our path for the next couple of months, there will be lots of invited lectures. There will be practical lectures done by me showing you really practical hands-on on the HPC, how it is working with Unix. That's what we start very early on, what is SSH, but then also learning a bit about C programming, MPI programming, OpenMP programming. So all of these require a little bit of, let's say, practical insights where I give you at least a couple of, you know, interesting lectures where you can follow and then, which of course then indirectly are directly linked to your assignments. So how you put this, let's say, practical knowledge in order to solve your own assignments. So with this, I would like to go a little bit to the course motivation, the first part of the lecture today, which is a prologue. So we really take it a bit slow in the beginning just to understand the course, understand what are the techniques, what are the global picture here. And I think when you look at this, it's best explained. So high performance computing is the formula one of computing. So we always change. We always basically have a constant change with our systems, with our technologies. 10 years ago, nobody was talking about GPUs. Now suddenly everybody is talking about GPUs. Now basically we have large data sets alongside, but what's always a common theme is like having this kind of science and engineering problems that you see here on the right-hand side, like let it be weather prediction, terrestrial systems, or here you have the idea of how smoke eventually would, you know, basically evolve through a tube could be let's say a subsurface somewhere a tram or something like this um, but also car crashes and so forth so i think many of the scientific applications you already heard of you already know and these are the so-called domain specific science and engineering application we try to take it a little bit in this hpc course you see here the red heart the red heart of the hpc course where we take some of those but we cannot tackle all of them but when we pick some of those, we really make sure to have some interesting messages across, like the one you see here in the smoke. You see that the mesh around the smoke, and you know what the mesh means, basically, when we come to subsequent lectures, then basically you see that it's adaptive, it's really evolving over time and so forth. And these are techniques which are, you know, in each of the different lectures will be alongside domain-specific science engineering codes evolved. There's one kind of general idea throughout this course. And of course, this is to make you sure having, let's say, the basics of programming in parallel. And how this could work is a little bit explained on the left-hand side, where you have the main paradigm called MPI, the message passing interface. Message passing, you see, it's pretty obvious here. So one processor is talking to another processor in a distributed memory fashion. That means you cannot access the other memory. We will talk about this really in detail in one of the next lectures. But then there's another paradigm where you have a shared memory where basically all the different threads on one processor can access the same memory and then with this exchange some data. These are two fundamental different paradigms, how you operate, how you program HPC machine. And of course, today we even use that in a so-called hybrid programming fashion. So we use distributed computing together with shared memory and with this having very sophisticated applications. So the motivation really for the core is to understand parallel processing. With this, the distributed nature of the HPC machines come into play. We already heard about that basically distributed memory, shared memory, there's some distributed fashion in this when you really scale up having a whole computing room full of computers you're already going automatically distributed of some sort so you have different cluster parts you have different racks we will talk about this throughout the course and it basically really matured over the last three decades so it comes from more and more science into really practicalities used by industry not only science and engineering there's lots of innovation in terms of hardware and software. 
So people talk about this today more or less about scientific computing, but you heard this term before and some people associated with Maple, uh, with MATLAB, with maybe also these days Python libraries doing scientific computing. But here we're really talking about much more than serial computing can ever imagine. So here it's not about desktop PCs or laptops. Here we think about how many cores you can bring together in order to solve a bigger scientific problem today. And this means we have to go in parallel. We basically want to have very good and fine-grained and detailed applications. Think about weather prediction. You don't want to have a coarse-grained analysis of this. You want a fine-grained analysis, what the weather in Garabash, what the weather in Reykjavik itself, what the weather in Akure. You're not interested in a weather forecast for whole Iceland. You want to have details. And the more basically you go into the details, the more complex it gets. And then basically on a serial computer, you really get quickly into memory limits. And to get away with memory limits is one of the motivation with this in parallel computing to do really so-called advanced scientific computing, which you can use with so-called simulations and large scale and machine and deep learning today, where you really use cutting edge codes, cutting edge scientific problems in order to have some basically um, application tackle that could be really society relevant, like the weather prediction or avalanche prediction. So avalanche, you know, protection mechanism construction is basically driven by those simulations as well, when we have some examples when we think about terrestrial systems. So many of these are really bound to reality. So that's why we call it sometimes simulations of reality, which is based on physical laws, numerical methods, basically in order to uh, basically approximate the reality as best as we can with this simulate, making a bridge perhaps from theory to experiments in the real practice. So the learning outcomes then in the course is basically really understand parallel processing and with this understanding really HPC at all. Um, we will do certain things like understanding what is a high performance cluster, what is a networking in it that makes it a high performance machine. We will talk about more big data topics like data intensive workloads. And one of the important things in the course will be the domain decomposition, which is a loaded word. But if you want to simulate, let's say, the heat and so on in, in a room like our classroom that we don't have right now because of COVID, so everything is virtual. But now, basically, think about this. You want to understand that you maybe break it down in different pieces in order to understand and model the window, in order to understand and model basically the door, in order to model maybe the heat ventilation system that is maybe in the classroom. So basically you come down to the problem that in order to do a large scale simulation in HPC, you usually try to see what the big domain is, simulation of an earthquake, simulation of weather, simulation of a car crash. In order to simulate the whole domain, as it is called, you decompose, you really put it into smaller pieces in order to do parallel computing of all the smaller pieces. And we will talk about this in one of our next lecture, what domain decomposition is. So in the end, then you come to a problem which is parallel programming being very complex. And there should be not a, you know, a simplification on this because in the end, parallel programming codes really in science and engineering can be very tough, can be very complex. But of course, this is an introductionary course to HPC, so we keep it to a reasonable level of understanding. And with this, you're really best suited to really tackle then also HPC codes in science and engineering later when you're interested to stay in this community. So you really are equipped of understanding HPC, of understanding the programming paradigms with MPI, with OpenMP, but then also accelerators, GPUs using CUDA and so on. So basically, these are all important aspects in the course. And of course, the parallelization aspect of it will be a mainstream, starting already, of course, with our next lecture. Just a little bit to the course setup, why you see many different logos that all give some funding into that or for some students here in the first place. Um, basically, you see here one of my um, centers, Uli Supercomputing Center, where I'm 
basically working since around, I have to say, around 18 years now. So it's, uh, you see a little bit in the middle of the jungle there around different trees. It's one of the national, um, you know, national labs of Germany, really. But then also Germany has many national labs in this Helmholtz Association, as you see on the right hand side. And this is a unique, um, you know, research lab at all, all these different institute and, you know, the supercomputing center, which is my host. But now I'm also a full professor here at the University of Iceland. And we have a very strong collaboration with the Uli Supercomputing Center. So this is a 200 man people driving one of the best European HPC machines and keeping that alive, working on the maintenance, providing excellent supports and libraries and so forth. And you will understand that throughout the course much more. So from all these 5,000 people here on the campus, we have like 200 to 300 people um, really taking care that there's a central supercomputing machine, not only fueling European researchers and German researchers, but basically also today international research. So <clears throat> why I'm talking to you about HPC? So the first question you would have is, what is this guy talking about and why he has a right to talk about you, um, you know, with HPC? So basically I did my PhD already in HPC and grid a long time ago. Um, I had lots of different positions at the Ulich Computing Center. Uh, as I said, I was there 18 years. So obviously, I was, you know, deputy division leader, strategic um, director of some initiatives with CERN and the Large Hadron Collider down in Switzerland in grid and cloud activities. Um, interestingly enough, I also kept a very good bound always to my U.S. partners being one of the architects of the extreme science and engineering discovery environment exceed in the US, but also on the data side, because HPC is always very much also on the forefront of big data, of large quantities of data. I'm also there very active in the European data infrastructure, um, leading the research data alliance, big data analytics, but also having you know different initiatives supported like the steering group, maybe of the Helmholtz Artificial Intelligence Initiative, but more interestingly for Iceland, maybe here is that I'm also the um, governing board member for Iceland of the so-called European uh, Euro HPC joint undertaking. And I will talk about this a little bit more in the next lecture when we talk about this, what it is and what impact it has. But also here in one of the slides, I have much more material. Of course, obviously, in the last um, 18 years, I was not always a professor. I turned to be a professor here at the University of Iceland around 2012, 2013. And since then, I was giving HPC A, HPC B lectures with an emphasis on big data, then statistical data mining, machine learning topics, cloud computing and big data. And all of those are basically somehow available either on YouTube, either on my webpage if you want to know more or just approach me if you want to know more. So the University of Iceland, of course, um, interesting enough, has a new logo, which is important for you as students, I think, here to know and to realize. Also for a PhD student taking this course. And the School of Engineering here um, of Science and Engineering is a very lively school. It has, let's say, very much interesting, quick advances to industry, to patents. You see here one of my colleagues, uh, what I found interesting was this nasal spray. But also when you think about the performance and ranking for a relatively small country, we are still one of the six best universities in the world in a field called remote sensing, where I work actively in. So an interesting um, environment. We have a long collaboration with the Jülich Research Center. And with this, um, basically many different PhD students going back and forth and taking different courses. And one of those collaborations is basically incorporated with my research group, the High Productivity Data Processing. When you come to us in Groska here in the University of Iceland, you see there's one room with around four PhDs filled, which do a PhD in collaboration with Uli Supercomputing Center and a couple of other uh, PhD students, which are basically in Uli hosted, but visit us here this year in the University of Iceland, like Rocco and Shadi, for instance. So it's a very interesting collaboration, fueled also by the fact that we are a national research lab and we collaborate a lot with university outside. 
So the structure that ULIC is operating and we basically is to have this domain specific simulation in data labs and that's the structure we also basically create right now in Iceland. We have cross-sectional deep like deep learning I was long a leader of and basically also drive lots of activities of the Helmholtz AI Artificial Intelligence Corporation unit. But of course, one of the hearts of the activities of the ULIC Computing Center are the facilities. So we we'll see a modular supercomputer called Eureka but also a modular supercomputer called Juvels, and both of them are really cutting edge in Europe. And alongside you see data lifecycle labs, although this is more and more joined to so-called simulation and data labs, and then many of the exascale co-design activities where we have been, for instance, this my research group very active in the deepest EU projects. In other words, for US students, that means we are basically cutting edge research that we try to bring into the teaching um, as much as we can. Of course, we teach a lot of aspects which have, let's say, a long duration time for you to understand, to keep. So some of the things we do maybe are not really reflected in teaching right now. But another element is also that you see here in the examples of really research applications from our Smart Data Innovation Lab, uh, a medical project called Smith here, Smart Medical Information Technology for Healthcare, or remote sensing and health data sets that we will analyze really from practice in science just to get you an understanding. And of course, we don't um, neglect the industry domain. So one of my PhD students in the past was doing, you know, the soccer watch. Basically, you can see it as uh, basically in the web these days. Soccer watch now being extended to basketball. Or Landsvikun is another industrial partner where we do teeth with. So very interesting to also think that HPC has an impact in industry as well. So here's a little bit the idea of having a broader picture um, in the way, firstly, about the Euro HPC joint undertaking. This is very important because now Europe really agrees to a joint roadmap, to a joint, let's say, activity stream of, let's say, projects, of activities to bring HPC in the forefront of all the different countries. So we have a Euro CC project with around 34 countries on board where Iceland is part of in order to drive so-called EHPC or HPC National Competence Centers. And the EHPC here really means Icelandic HPC, what we have. So if you go to the IHPC.is website, you will see this community, depending basically on the experience of many different sciences in all the different simulation data labs that you see that that is constantly basically increased as well. We also being part of many European projects which are doing research like Admire project here, where we do remote sensing application co-design of new HPC systems, um, which is basically of course orthogonal to the one structure here of the community building exercise of the EuroCC project. Then when it comes more to the data centric aspects, we are also very much part of the European Open Science Cloud. Also this will be here and there actually explained as part of the course how you deal with big data, how you share data sets, how you employ data sets with basically having proper metadata alongside it. So all of this is something we also discuss under the umbrella of EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud, where Iceland is part of the EOSC Nordic activities. So coming a bit more from the 10,000 feet perspective of the community, more to the technical aspects, what is now the difference if you think about high performance computing and high throughput computing? Both terms you maybe have known in the basically past and some of you have taken my uh, big data course. So you know what the difference is already. But here again, the stress is really or the emphasize really is on the interconnectivity on the cores. So when you want to have a HPC machine going towards excess scale performance, the top 500 supercomputers you would have this HPC machines being very well interconnected between all the cores. And so the network interconnection is important making it the HPC machine. High throughput computing is much more thinking about how much throughput I can have per machine. So the interconnection between them is not so important. You would say you prob have a big problem, you cut it into a very small, you let them independently solve a problem or nicely parallel solving the problem. And at the end, you may be interested to join the results. 
but that's really more high throughput computing. So high performance computing like the weather forecast needs the interconnectivity. You need every second to know what's actually rain, what physical parameters are on your next, you know, parameters in your actually direct neighbor. And all of this is not really obvious. That's why we have some of the lectures tackling weather forecasts, tackling terrestrial systems. But here the network interconnection is very important because every minute you need to exchange the physical parameters in order to simulate properly what's happening. And the same would be going for fire, for smoke, as we have seen in one of the lecture uh, slides before. So here HPC enables us with this network connection to have really interesting applications tackled that you cannot solve with high throughput computing. Now, HPC has a very long history and I start here very early on, more or less, when you think about um, where we are going now in the exascale domain, you see a supercomputing in the 80s having 1 million flops per second, so floating point operations per one second. So this is the abbreviation of flops. And here, this was a supercomputer a kind of laptop at that time of light in, in 84. And today, when you think about more 2009-ish, um, you see here an upgrade of a system which had already, you, lay, you see one to the power of 15 flops per second. And today we even talk about, um, you know, to the power of 18 flops per second. So going to exascale from petascale, um, you see that a little bit explained here in the overview. So this is a common race in high performance computing, always making it better, always making it bigger. But when we do this, the only point is not to doing it for fun, but to increase scientific value to basically a very good driving applications that could in a way forever need more computing resources. You talk about the human brain, we can just simulate parts of the human brain to really understand Alzheimer's or neuro diseases um, very much. So basically what we need is much more computing to understand these aspects. And the same goes for accurate detailed weather predictions, right? On the maybe garden level. You can understand that maybe in theory today, because we know all the physical laws, we know many of the you know, ideas how that works, but the computing you need for basically having this or extreme weather conditions to understand them properly is still order of magnitudes. So here the drive is always, as you see here, going to more and more resources. And here your queen was the next system, which basically is then um, here still a U blue gene system. And that's what I want to convey also with the technology changes. So you see here an EBM supercomputer technology, which was one of the top three systems in Europe and is not existing anymore. So this supercomputing blue gene, um, let's say um, technology manufacturing stopped. So EBM discontinued this blue gene systems. We had a blue gene, you know, P, we had a blue gene Q, and before that, even another one. But it doesn't matter, though. That, that shows you that being on the forefront of computing with Cray, with EBM, with other vendors really means it's a very lively culture. You know, systems are discontinued. Systems are, let's say, very new. It's very hard to program them because they're full of errors. So this is really something where you think about the Formula One of you know computing always having new aspects like you know the accelerators that no everybody understands but 15 years ago it was just a gaming card so how you program it for its general purpose how you program it for the benefit of science was not at all clear 15 years ago now it's clear but of course this has been a long time of evolution so with this slide, I want to not only show how Jülich is structured with this kind of having two different ideas of how users actually use HPC resources. There's a general purpose idea of using a cluster. So really um, highly interconnected GPUs, CPUs, and so on. But then also a more highly scalable way where you basically have lots of codes which are you know, enabling um, high orders of magnitudes of scale where you don't need the number crunches, so to speak, that are in the clusters. 
So and supporting both is one of the concepts that we drive in the Yuli Supercomputing Center with this modular supercomputing approach and this deep series of projects we have been before in, also as the University of Iceland was contributing to some of the applications in the earth sciences and remote sensing. And now there are new project launches in the deep umbrella, like the Deep Sea project, which is much more about the software for exascale architectures in the future. So an interesting idea of how to do a, a supercomputer, we will learn more about it throughout the course. Also, you will get, let's say, hands-on on a modular supercomputing system. And of course, it was a driving vehicle and is a driving vehicle for research alongside, you see here, a little bit of research on the so-called NUM and basically um, interface that is directly memory um, at the network. So this is a quite interesting new paradigm not existing before, where you basically have a network aware memory really um, sitting on the network and having memory aspects there, which means exchange for different applications in terms of memory is much more simpler but also, of course, a very new technology and also something which is more prototype right now. But also there, the idea of having this modular supercomputer, which means cluster modules for high single thread performance or cutting edge CPUs, extreme scale boosters with a lot of GPUs scaling out, or data analytics modules with high amount of memory supporting things like Apache Spark, Apache Hadoop, we will talk about it. And some of you from the cloud computing course we already know about this, so this is much more this domain. And then you have a lot, large storage module, really a kind of parallel file system that supports all of this. And with this, you have different applications really fueling these systems using different of these modules in between and also so-called quantum manilas and new forms of computing where my team already do some applications and some publications as well. In the course, you will use the deep system, so you will be joined to a so-called project joinal for your assignments or one or two assignments. And basically, we will talk about this, of course, much more in the practical lectures, just saying that you, of course, will be using one of these cutting edge HPC machines, um, definitively. When it comes to the organization of the course, um, I think it's pretty obvious for you right now. Many of you have been already part of the situation that we changed from UCLA to this now canvas situation. Now we do this, um, I think around two years now. So many of you will already know that we basically mostly operate in the canvas environment. Also here in this course, this will be our major, let's say course information communication hub. But also if you have difficulties in the course, if you, you want to know more, uh, please don't wait too long. Um, use my office hours, send a request to morris at howe.is. And then we can schedule some virtual office hours as it is right now in the pandemic. It is not really easy probably to meet in person, but we can always meet in Zoom, no problem. But for every general information, I would basically um, point you to the canvas. Also the announcements there are very important. I announce lectures, I remind you of lectures, I remind you of assignments and so forth. Another frequently asked questions, of course, about the course is usually the overall course grading. So I put that here in the slides. We will have three assignments, two of which are 10% and one is a bigger one, which is 20% of the grade. You have two to three people usually working on this, doing some small parallel programming. There will be not big parallel programming uh, requirements, but still a little bit of C coding will be part of the course. So it's a bit more detailed than the, let's say, cloud computing course. And with this, we have, would have 40% of the grade. Uh, many of you from the cloud computing course will also know this quizzes like 10% of the grade. So here um, we do just very small tests every now and then where, you know, basically each of the tests is like 2% of the grade or 2.5% roughly. There will be quiz one, quiz two, quiz three. And the first quiz is actually a kind of test exam to train you to really know what is the preparation for the exam, how the exam questions would be looking like. And then of course the exam is 50% of the grade will be a major thing, but we will prepare with this with the quizzes over time so that you really usually come out with a good grade about this. So here um, this would be looking like the end of the course in April. Here and there we will have also selected invited lectures that are all not necessarily relevant for your grade, but I encourage you to 
basically participate in that because it could be about, you know, companies, interesting jobs, PhD studies, and so forth. Here's an example and also um, hinting again to the Q&A. You see on the right-hand side the example from the cloud computing course we had last time with the different ideas how the quizzes look like, the assignments look like, and then the exam, and how much is that of the whole total of the grade. But then also all the Q&A will be tackled in two ways. Firstly, we have this add tool, which is integrated in Canvas right now. So everybody of you will be having access to this. And we also aim for one week, um, basically every week we'll do a Q&A session via Zoom, at least one hour on Tuesdays probably, um, in order to really tackle problems and solving questions. Then the overall recordings of each lecture will be available to you in the YouTube um, channel from me to make it accessible to the larger community, to all the European projects also. Um, and basically each lecture will be two parts. So we basically close also almost here the prologue part one, but the part two will be coming after next. And we basically have the two videos. And if you go to the YouTube channel, you see already examples of the course from last year of the cloud computing course from fall and so forth. But also don't hesitate to engage with us on social media. This is a big theme today, important for our projects which give funding, also to be visible, to give the taxpayers something in return to have visible research, visible teaching. And you see, we also distribute there what be happening basically in terms of um, teaching. So for literature, which is usually a question, um, you would have lots of different materials in each of the different lectures. You see a lecture bibliography will be a big theme, three slides, two slides, usually always in all the different lectures I have. And then of course, there's one book that makes make be interesting to look at, but I also would say it's much more important to look on all these different bibliography resources because they have also HPC community ideas and things which, you know, in a book would be very quickly out of, um, you know, the reality because the systems are so evolving quickly these days that just for the fundamental paradigms like OpenMP, MPI, I would refer to this book. But for many architectures of HPC, for projects, lessons learned, tutorials, I would refer more to these web pages. So that's why the lecture bibliography is one source for you to learn more. You see here also the course over the years got very good reviews in social media from colleagues internationally. Um, so it really basically was evolving in the last seven, eight years with content and I hope it will be an added value to you. I would like to finish the first part of the course with a very important video um, about praise, um, which is basically an important infrastructure today in terms of scientific computing, but it's also basically changed a little bit in the moment with the idea of the EuroHPC joint undertaking. But still, this video captures the essence what you know high performance computing is. So please have a look at this video and then join us back for the second part of the course. What was the start of the universe like? Are there other Earth-like planets? Can we predict earthquakes? Can we cure cancer? Can we predict and prevent heart attacks? Can we sustainably fuel the world? Supercomputing turns dreams into ideas that can change the world. Dare to think the impossible. High performance computing uh, is like uh, the big all of the big instruments of science combined into one. So it's a telescope that enables us to view the entire universe. It's a microscope or a particle accelerator which enables us to explore the quantum world of the very small. It's a reactor that enables us to study plasmas uh, and what's going on in the interior of stars. And it's even a time machine which enables us to recreate the past or to predict what's going to happen in the future. Almost all of the major challenges that society faces, whether it's preserving our environment, improving our health care, or rebuilding our economy, uh, are underpinned in some way or another 
by a high performance computer. Okay, coming back to this, I would like to close with this first part of the prologue and would like to welcome you to the second part uh, basically later on.